Tonight on a special Dan Rather Reports. The commercialization of college admissions has created a crisis by undermining educational values. And this commercialization was led by the ranksters, by the rankings. A rare behind the scenes look at the high stakes, high money world of the college admissions process. The more we look at getting into college as a prestige game in which some win and others lose rather than as unfolding opportunity for all, we're just lost. We'll bring you the news tonight on Dan Rather Report. Good evening. Our report tonight is about a right of spring for two and a half million high school students and their parents. For spring is the season of the acceptance, and for that matter, rejection, letters from college. These envelopes that come in the mail are the high stakes payoff for a year long process, a process that forces students to make one of their first real adult decisions and will lead parents to spend sums of money that are usually reserved for buying houses. The process of applying to college has become so tortured and demanding that many people, students, teachers, and experts, say the system is broken. And college admissions also strike at some of the most controversial issues facing the country. Questions of race, wealth, privilege, and economic class. Tonight we're going to give you a rare behind the scenes look at the application process and ask the basic questions. Is it fair? And does it serve the interests of parents, students, or the colleges themselves? From the historic quads of the Ivy League to the sprawling campuses of Southern California, from large public universities to small private colleges, more than 20 million students are currently enrolled in an American institution of higher education. A hundred years ago, college was the domain of the elite. Now, it's become an important part of a much wider fabric of American life. But before you can end up at an academic oasis like the University of Chicago, you need to get in. We came here because the admissions committee agreed to allow our cameras into their private meetings. You are witnessing a seldom seen peek into the college admissions process. The future lives of high school seniors hang in the balance, and similar meetings are taking place in colleges and universities across the country. Those of us who would like to defer Albert, and those of us willing to admit Albert. The names have been changed, but the decisions you are seeing being made here are real. I would like to present Jenny Cruz, she has a nearly flawless transcript. Any sense of where she is in this class? Can you tell she's anything in, they see in the profile? She's in the top 5% of her class. Did you mention her scores? This year, the University of Chicago received more than 12,000 applications. Most are read, reread, and voted on privately by several members of the admissions committee, like Josh LaBeouf. They pass along their thoughts to other readers. More important than any sort of vote is the kind of write-up that we do that we leave to the next reader um, so that I can say, you know, take a look at this, think about this. Um, this is really something important. This is something to look out for. The objective is to have these files read by a lot of people and to give these files an opportunity to really be seen by different eyes. Um, we really seek to understand the student that, that's been presented to us. We, we don't know what's not here. We don't know what, what's, what hasn't come in that envelope, but we we, we make it our job to understand the student and to understand the kind of person they would be here on our campus. The majority of students got accepted or rejected during this reading process. But a few hundred students with mixed reviews end up here, where all factors are weighed openly. 
I liked Dina. I liked her writing. I liked the voice that came through very well. I'm, I'm not as convinced as you are that other than the fact that she's kind of a nice kid that she's going to make an impact. He's an athlete. He was a uh, varsity soccer player. He's someone who's going to push himself, and he is going to see this as a challenge. You know, he's from a school that I have some doubts about. Is it going to be too much of a shock for him to maybe not get all A's? I'm not as concerned about the math because how many students, again, don't end up doing what they say they're intended major. Right. I mean, I, you know me and scores. I mean, I, I think they're the devil's playground. Ted O'Neill is the Dean of Admissions at the University of Chicago. I think we kind of know what we're doing and what we're after. I think we do it with the, in the best possible spirit, and I have some confidence that we actually make the best decisions possible and that we do it according to a, um, a set of principles that we believe in. There's no abyss about this girl. The, the poetry isn't gloomy poetry. The poetry isn't lonely poetry. College admissions is part science. Is it for you? Part art. There are so-called objective criteria, like test scores and grades. Math with Bs and B minuses. He's gotten nothing but As. Well, then what's the weakness? The 720 on the verbal score. He's like more than 100 points below our 25th percentile mark. These are used as shortcuts to categorize large segments of applicants. But there are also subjective aspects of college admissions, like essays. And every admissions committee must find a balance. The University of Chicago is famous for using unusual essay questions. This year, they asked questions like, describe a picture and explore what it wants. O'Neill says he relies on these questions to allow individuals to emerge from broad demographics. Some are poets, some are mathematicians, some are poor, some are rich, some are from small towns. They have distinctive ways of saying things, and we're listening for that, and we're watching the way they use words, and we're watching them trying to think their way through an issue, which is why we ask such different questions. So he, he really kind of opened himself up in this essay, which I really appreciated. And she just picks her words awfully well. But I soon realized it was just the gears in my literary mind burning off the dust. The imagery that she used, I think I was transported to her bedroom looking at that bookshelf. I think we get to know some of them very well. They reveal themselves, not in a, in a, in a shocking or negative way, but they, re, they, they let us see themselves um, as they are, as they want to be. Admissions officers say the process isn't only about whether a student is right for a college, but whether a college is right for a student. For most of American history, the college admissions process required much less guesswork. When institutions only catered to elites, it was often the family names that got one accepted. Before the advent of air travel, even the Ivy League served a more regional student body. Many had quotas on minorities and were off limits to women. Now, Colleges and universities cater to a diverse student body drawn from across the country and around the world. And as the application process has become more democratic, the competition between schools and among students has become much more fierce. It's an ordeal of standardized tests, financial aid concerns, and sorting through reams of promotional materials. Advertisements from colleges stressing that attending their campus is the best first step to a fulfilling life. It can all be overwhelming. There are nearly 3,000 four-year colleges and universities in the United States. And you may wonder how students decide where to apply. One of the most common starting points is an elaborate college ranking system, a system that has exploded in popularity and has influenced, for better or for worse, the way parents, students, and the colleges all approach the admissions process. And for many, the ranking system has become synonymous with U.S. News and World Report. What started as a bonus section to sell magazines has spawned what some experts estimate to be a billion-dollar industry of college ranking materials. But it's U.S. News that's often still the first stop for parents and students. USNews.com is probably the single largest place where people get information about college. Brian Kelly is the editor of U.S. News. He says his magazine's rating system has become a vital tool for anyone looking at college. 
It's the only place they can come to get the full range of school choices that are in front of them. We think we've done a, a service for people by, sort of, by explaining to them just this large, complicated universe and at least giving them a first step to make sense out of it. U.S. News breaks the rankings down into subcategories by region and such things as black colleges and engineering programs. Kelly says the magazine carefully weighs 25 different factors to decide rankings. They range from the ubiquitous test scores of students accepted, to what percentage of applicants colleges let in, to how many alumni give money to their alma maters, and how much. And that's just the beginning. We look at the graduation rates, which is very important. We look at faculty resources, how much professors are paid, how many of them are full professors. Um, we look at a survey of other people in the industry, the top professionals in the industry, and ask them how they rank the other schools. So it's a big, complicated list of numbers that we collect, crunch together in an index, and that's how we come up with the top 100. And demand for those rankings grows each year with a new crop of seniors. The rankings have become hugely profitable for U.S. News. Within 72 hours of the rankings released this year, their website got 10 million page views. All the criteria ultimately boil down to a number, a ranking. But a growing number of critics believe trying to distill something as intangible as what's a good college down to a number has become a threat to the very purpose of higher education and a symbol for a much bigger problem. The commercialization of college admissions has created a crisis uh, by undermining educational values. And this commercialization was led by the ranksters, by the rankings. Lloyd Thacker is a vocal critic of college rankings and the entire application system. A former high school counselor in Oregon, he now leads a movement to change the status quo. And he wants to start with the ranking system because he thinks it gives a false patina of science, but is actually grounded in commercialism. Picking the best college for a student, his thinking goes, should not be like buying a car. Rankings imply a degree of precision and authority that is simply not supported by educational data. Their influence on education in this country has grown way beyond any kind of educational jurisdiction. They have distorted the way education is perceived and pursued among students, among families, among high schools, and most importantly and most alarmingly, among trustees of colleges. Why is it most important and most alarming among trustees of the colleges? Well, um, <laughs> colleges are businesses, but they're businesses of a special kind. They're institutions held in public trust, and they have an obligation to serve that trust, and that trust has to do with education in this country. And the rankings don't measure anything that's relevant to education, and yet the trustees are evaluating their own institution's goodness or, and, and their success as trustees by their college's rank. And some presidents are even being hired to improve the rank of the college. But U.S. News editor Brian Kelly says there's obviously a healthy market for rankings like his. And he says parents and students should be trusted enough to use them appropriately. Consumers are smart enough to make their own judgments. They know that schools that are closely grouped together um, are similar and, and the kind of places they might want to look at. The people who really get upset about it are the alumni and the college presidents and the people who look at this more as a horse race. But everything we've seen tell, tells us that students and parents know how to use these numbers to their own best use. But what Thacker hears from parents and students suggest otherwise. Dad says to son, you only got an 1100 on your SAT. You're a failure. If I don't get into a top-ranked college, I'll have to go to a public university. I'll be stupid. This process is so crazy, it has me doing things that are completely contrary to my values. Thacker travels the country, speaking at high schools about changing the psychology of applying to college. He says that the ranking system is about brand consciousness, not educational value. You got to go to the one best college. You got to go to the right college. A lot of emphasis on, on brand name here, folks. Now, I'm not saying that there aren't differences among colleges and that these differences don't matter. What I am saying is this current climate of commercialism in, in college admissions and this emphasis on prestige and selectivity and student choice is distorting the, the balance in a way that it is diminishing those things that are most important and those are the student qualities and overemphasizing the, the name of the college. And that's the message Thacker hammers home at his talks. 
and through a nonprofit organization he founded, the Education Conservancy. Could it be that there are many good schools, many good colleges, many places where good education happens, and that kids, what students do, their attitudes and behaviors, are more important for, for making quality education happen than is where that student went to college? Thacker is supported by contributions from over a dozen universities and foundations. And one recent success was this May 2007 letter labeling the current ranking system misleading and calling on colleges and universities to refuse to refer to the rankings as an indication of the quality of your college or university. 65 college and university presidents have signed on so far. If a college or university consistently appears in the top three, as a parent, why shouldn't that say to me, that's the place I want my child to go, and whatever it takes to give them the best chance to get in there, that's what I'm going to do. There's a big problem there, because what it's saying to our kids is that it's where you go that matters, it's not what you do. One of Thacker's biggest complaints is that students become too focused on getting into the best ranked school instead of finding the best school for them. Linda Berger has a daughter applying to college in the fall, and she says Lloyd Thacker's message really struck a chord. It's all about, you know, the reputation of the school and the rank of the school and the best school and, and going for your reach and the one that you didn't get into was, of course, the best one. Like, it's all just out of control. Berger says she wishes she and her daughter could resist the pressure of the college rat race. We all want to change it, but as an individual parent, how do you make that change? You know, to say to your kid, you be the different one and, and you're going to do it your way when everybody else is getting coached and everybody else is taking the test six times and applying to 12 schools and, you know, it's too big to be the one to try to change it but yet fail, you know, to take it on by yourself. I, it has to change from the schools. We visited a school that has taken on the system. Eckert, a liberal arts college in Florida with 1,800 students, decided to drop out of the U.S. News ranking system completely. The school's president, Donald Eastman, explained why. The biggest problem with the U.S. News and World Report rankings is they uh, asked presidents to rank something like two to three hundred different colleges on their uh, supposed knowledge of the quality of those institutions. From my own experience as a president, I know two or three institutions pretty well and four or five uh, generally, but I don't know anything about two or three hundred, so I think it's an exercise in folly. For parents who are saying to themselves, ah, I hate the rankings, but on the other hand, Ivy League schools, for example, always rank high, so I want my child to go to the school with, quote, the most prestige. Ivy League schools are great places, but let's face it, most of those schools that are at the top five, uh, 10, 15 of the rankings enroll about 1% uh, of the number of students that go to college in the United States. So by and large, they're not important to most people. And Eastman thinks his stand against the rankings will not hurt a college like Eckert. How do you expect that this is going to affect enrollment and applications for enrollment? The parents and students I've talked to, both prospective and the ones that are at our college, don't pay a whole lot of attention to those. They're looking for a place that's gonna fit their son or daughter it's going to provide the kind of education that their son or daughter needs, and they're looking way beyond those kind of superficial rankings. But Thacker says that parental pressure is real and not always obvious. And my parent will come in and talk to me when I used to be a counselor and said, we are applying to, you know, we are applying to these schools. We are filling out our application. Not Joe or Mary, we, we, we as a family. We, we, yeah. we, we. Yeah. So it's making parents tie their own kids' success to their to their success. Their success as a parent being validated by the name of the college their kid gets into. And it's, 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 it's insidious, I mean, it, and it's very dangerous to students. When we return, two sets of high school students from very different schools try to navigate the college admissions process. Stay with us. Great Neck South High School is the kind of place where students view going to college almost like a birthright. Every year, about 99% of the seniors will go on to higher education. Great Neck is a wealthy community on New York's Long Island, and among the students here, the question isn't whether they're going to college, but whether they'll get into the quote-unquote right school. Not everyone will get accepted to their top choice, 
Not everyone will go to a top-ranked university. And even in an affluent community like this, the high price of tuition will close doors to some colleges for some students. We sat down with a cross-section of Great Neck South High School seniors to hear their application stories. Justine, what's the general atmosphere around the senior class when it comes to trying to get into college or university? Uh, chaotic, definitely intense and competitive. I think the majority of people in our school are really like interested in getting to the best school they can and it becomes almost a competition with your peers as to where you're going. Justine Allen is a cheerleader at Great Neck South. Okay. Her classmate, Ethan Merbelstein, says college applications created a shadow over his senior year. Well, I try to avoid conversation about colleges just because it's so overwhelming and, and there's so much more to senior year and to life, but it really is very difficult to realize that, so I, I make a personal effort to not engage people in those conversations, but also because when I do, I get very nervous and <laughs> flustered that I'm not doing something that my peers aren't doing. I definitely do feel the pressure. Danielle Kipnis did theater work in school and is aware of how big a role extracurricular activities play in the application process. Never wear mob at a ball. People are definitely saying like, oh, you know, you should do that for college. Like, it looks for good for college. That's definitely something that's going on throughout all your four years. I can apply early to Princeton, Yale, Columbia, and Stanford. Nancy Wang is a first-generation American. She says she feels the weight of her entire family's expectations on her shoulders. There's a stereotype that every single Asian parent wants their child to get trade A's and take all these advanced placement courses and honors classes. So at home, it's, it's not only you should get into college, it's you should get into a really good college because you've worked hard in school, you know? They're worried about not getting into school with enough of a name. Tom Gaines has heard it all. He's a guidance counselor who has worked at the school for 22 years. He's having a crisis, but it's totally my turn. In the fall, there is a constant stream of students coming into his office with long lists of questions about college. Students like Juliet Perot. For the common application, like on the activities, there's something that says like school spirit. What do, is that an activity? I have school spirit. Like, yes, you do. Okay. There's um, a section that says future plans. Can I just write, I don't know? Yeah, undecided. Remember when I told you I went to a fair? Right. It was a popcorn sale for epilepsy. Okay. Does that matter? I don't no. Know. That's, okay. not, that's not going to be a determining okay. factor whether you get into college or not. Okay. Gaines checks college essays. That's good. Really? Yeah. You hate all of my essays and you like this one that I wrote I in half an hour? I hate all essays. Well, maybe because it was you didn't overthink it. Because they all it. suck. He tries to settle nervous minds. You have to stick to your guns. I mean, do you think that I'm a Wesleyan kind of person? And sometimes his counseling has to become much more personal. I don't think my father wants me going to the colleges that I'm applying to. He's a little late into the whole... Yeah, I know, but I like heard them fighting last night. So well, let your mother know. negotiate that. Is it Vanderbilt or is it he, he doesn't approve? He doesn't think it's like a good school and that it's the right school and it's too far away and he wants to come have brunch with me on Sundays. I don't even know. Gaines says the early and intense obsession with college doesn't benefit anybody. Kids aren't allowed to just be kids, have fun, enjoy themselves, go out after school. It's all you know about, you know, you have this goal. You have to go to college. You have to go to the best college you go to. And record numbers of students are spending their time in expensive after-school courses run by companies like Princeton Review and Kaplan. You could have gone immediately from here to here. Three times six is 18. Less is more. Okay, there's always a trick. It's not the math is easy, it's the tricks. Always the tricks. Critics okay. say that in these programs, students learn little more than test-taking strategies. But there's a prevailing thought that not taking these courses puts college applicants at a distinct disadvantage. Probably 70% of all seniors this year have taken some kind of prep course. You know, and we have 295 seniors at $1,000 a pop. Yeah, you know, that's a lot of money. I don't think that the thought ever crossed my mind not to take a prep course. I mean, for me at least, the course helped 
um, personally for myself, I felt like I had this huge obligation to go to these courses and to get a tutor and to do all this stuff. It's all become an essential part of the cost of applying to college for those who can afford it. Parents really drive this. I mean, they, if they have money, they're the ones who are going to go out and spend money for SAT tutors. The guilt involved with this college admission thing has become tremendous. And some parents are willing to pay for much more than just test prep, like Rhode Island mother Robin Smollett's. When my son started going through the college admissions process, we realized we needed an expert with a great deal of market intelligence in the college, college admissions process, above and beyond what we knew and above and beyond what our college counselor in his school could provide us. Smollett's turned to Michelle Hernandez, who calls herself a college consultant. She takes two dozen students each year some even as early as the eighth grade. Part of my job with anyone is really trying to come up with an edge for them. So in the case of a student, let's say, who was already in 10th grade, who had a couple of interests but hadn't gone above and beyond in pursuing them, I would say, okay, great, you like international relations. Now you need to build up a couple of summers worth of concrete achievements. Maybe you'll, you'll write an article for the Concord Review and get it published that had to do with history or international relations or do an independent study or go to a summer academic program where you get to explore that more. You simply have to go above and beyond and do things outside of what's asked for by your high school. And when it comes time to fill out the all-important applications, Hernandez says it's not something to take lightly. Generally, we do eight to ten drafts of every single piece of the application. That's why it takes 50 to 100 hours to get it all done over the summer. All this individual attention comes with a hefty price tag. Hernandez's fee is as much as $40,000. She says she gets her clients into the Ivy Leagues at seven times the national average. I mean, I think it's fairly easy to justify the cost because, again, I think of it as an investment. It really, I think, depends on your emphasis in how important education is to you. I've had wealthy families who think I charge too much and won't pay it because they would rather put their money elsewhere, and I've had very poor families who will put the money together to pay me, their kids get into a better school, and then they get financial aid and grants, and, you know, they've, they've made their money back. So, you know, I think it does pay off. I just think it depends how important education is. To some parents, it's not that important. Robin Smollett's son got into Johns Hopkins, his first choice. To see my son accomplish what he has with the great confidence that he did, it was a, a, a great comfort as a parent to knowing we were doing the best that we would, could do within our abilities to find someone with the expertise to guide us to that level of knowledge in the marketplace. It's this view of education as a marketplace that drives activist Lloyd Thacker crazy. I am not here to tell you and your kids how to get into the most competitive college. It's not my job. My job is to invite you to think about education. There's a professor at uh, top Ivy League school. He said to me, Thacker, there's something terribly wrong. He said, this class, we're told, has the highest average SAT scores, the highest average GPA, you know, 4.9 or something. And I can tell you that this class is less connected to learning than any class I've ever taught. So in other words, somebody's responsible for telling the kids what's important. They're performing to meet our expectations, and yet the educational outcomes are not those that we would desire. Fundamental flaw in the system. How does this affect the high school experience for students? High school should be a terrific experience, both in planting the seeds of curiosity and imagination, confidence. achievement, and confidence, but it also should be fun. Absolutely, the fun is gone for too many students. And we don't know how many this is affecting, but, but more and more kids are using high school as a testing ground for college in that what do I have to do in order to get? And they'll do whatever it takes to get. And for Thacker, this mindset does not make for engaged college students. We have an artificial bunching of applications at the most selective colleges. We have more stratification than ever before because this favors the rich. We have more gaming than ever before. We have more dishonesty than ever before. We have more dropouts than ever before. It's not a good scene. And for large segments of the American population, particularly those who are economically disadvantaged, Thacker says the current application system is not serving their needs at all. Here's the dean of an Ivy League school calling me up uh, several months ago and said, you know, this system is really terrible, he says. The kids 
the high end, the, the privileged kids who can afford to spend that money, are completely missing it by overpackaging themselves. And the kids at the low end, the disenfranchised kids, are further disenfranchised because the system has become so costly, confounding, and, and, and convoluted. And colleges are not acting as engines of social mobility. They're, they're perpetuating class. Engines of social mobility. Yeah. Is that supposed to be the American way, that colleges and universities are engines of social mobility? Those, I mean, I want to believe that that's the case. And there are other ed educators that have described their, their role uh, and the role of colleges as, as serving equity and access and excellence in America. Yes. And uh, if not them, then who? And it goes back to Jefferson saying, you know, education is the bulwark of democracy and the way that we pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. Sure. Fact, fiction, or hard to tell? that the current system clearly favors wealthier students? Um, I, I think it does. It favors wealthy students in helping them gain access. Does it favor them in helping them become better students is, is, is the real question. Wealthy students are not what you'll find at Central High School in Providence, Rhode Island. Here, only about 20% of seniors will attend a four-year college well below the national average. Part of guidance counselor Renee Bailey's job is college counseling, but her time is occupied with a long list of larger concerns. This morning I dealt with um, a homeless student who came in um, who was hungry and came in to, for breakfast. I had a student who came to me yesterday who was suicidal. Um, students who um, have been thrown out of their house, students who are going home and, and, and being displaced out of their apartments teen pregnancy in the building, and then there are a lot of the academic issues, the students struggling in a class. Or All this leaves little time for college counseling, but Bailey says when she does talk to students about higher education, she often has to start with the basics. You gotta pick a major. Even if, it, even if you pick something now, you may change your mind, and you may change your mind three or four times between now and then, so that's taken care of. Don't lose that, stick that back in. So many of them are the first to apply to college in their families. We're still dealing with the first to graduate from high school. So just getting them to understand that they can go to college um, is, is a, is, can be overwhelming, but it, that's part of the process, and it's, it's very rewarding to see a student actually apply to college who, as a freshman, didn't think that they were even going to graduate from high school. Students like senior Kayla Gonzalez. I think I pretty much always knew that I wanted to go to college. Kayla is the youngest of eight children raised by a single mom, and she's trying to be the first in her family to go to college. She and her classmates live in a world where education usually ends with high school. There was a point in my life where I wasn't sure. I felt like, you know, maybe college isn't for me. I saw a lot of things going on in my life, and, like, you know, when you're not headed toward a good path, is, is college is not something that you think of. I would say it's still worth throwing in your essay. Trying to get students like Kayla on that good path are people like Hannah Lewis. And do you have a teacher recommendation as well? A recent college graduate herself, she's part of a year-old national program called the College Advising Corps. Its mission is to give students at high schools like this some of the same advantages found in wealthier communities. All the students I'm working with are first-generation college-bound students, so none of their parents have, have graduated from a four-year college. But some of them have a sense of, of how the process works, and others have really not been exposed at all. They're really starting from square one. For example, in the fall, I encountered students who did not even know they needed to take the SATs um, to, to get started with the, the college application process. So what I wanted to do with you today is just talk to you a little bit about interview prep. Think about how you might want to phrase an answer and not get thrown off if they ask you something quirky like that. Right? Students at Central, they really need to be self-motivated. It's not just going to happen because there's so much information that you need to know and there's so many steps to the process. Um, Hannah, she helped me like, uh, like um, every step of the way for the college process. Marlene Jacquet is trying to fulfill the dreams of her mother who immigrated from Haiti. I think my mother was my inspiration to go to college. She's always encouraged me because, like, education is, like, you know, my passport to the future and things like that. When she was in Haiti, she went, did go to college, but then when she came here, she had to start all over again. So she couldn't get, like, to the point that she wanted to reach in life. So, like, you know, now it's, like, my chance to, you know, do the best I can. 
But Marlene feels her economic background has made her path to college more difficult than it is for wealthier students. And no, I wish I was a lot more prepared for it. Basically, my financial situation like held me back from getting the SAT preparation. Because if I had like you know the money and like the means to do it, then I would have done it. And paying for SAT classes is just the beginning. While college tuition is daunting for families of all income levels, many of the students here would qualify for generous aid packages. But they don't know it. They just think college is not for them. We often have to convince students. Most of the time, it's, they'll say they don't have the money. And it, it's, they, they don't even want to bother to apply because they don't have the money, they can't afford it. And we explain to them different programs. We talk to them about financial aid. Bailey can tell her students that last year, three quarters of all full-time undergrads got some form of financial aid. But this money isn't just earmarked for students from low-income families. They have to compete for it with students from middle and upper-income families. That's because an education at a private four-year college can cost up to $50,000 a year, with an average cost of more than $30,000. And public universities can also be expensive, up to $20,000 a year for in-state students and as much as twice that for out-of-staters. It's numbers like these that make students at Central High think college is an impossibility. I think there is a lot of fear from parents about money, um, about how to pay for college. I know I spoke with um, one student's mother um, earlier in the fall and she said, well, I don't know about this college application process. I don't want my daughter to apply and get her hopes up and then not be able to afford it. Um, so that was very, you know, um, that was heartbreaking to hear. But okay, so you don't need to include that because that's all the same. Part of Hannah's job is to counsel about financial aid and she's been giving Kayla advice, advice Kayla's older siblings never got. Like, I mean, my sister tried and she tried to go, but it just became such a burden because she had to work and my mom had to work and we only had one car and it just, it just, it wasn't meant for them to be at college at that time. Many of our parents already have a plan for their, their child. They're going to graduate from high school, they're going to get a job and they're going to work and help support the family. But Kayla is thinking long term. If I go to college, it's going to give me more skills, more more opportunities, more things that I can do in my life. If I just have a high school education, there's only so much that I can do. But with a college education, I can keep going and I can do anything. But applying to college and getting in are two different things. The competition to get into college is intense. More seniors than ever before are applying to college. This has led to record low acceptance rates at both public and private institutions. At most colleges, a student's chances are improved if the applicant is, say, an athlete, a musician, a minority, or if he or she is the child of an alumnus, otherwise known as a legacy. Colleges call these kinds of applicants tagged, and at some schools, up to 40% of the spots are reserved for tagged applicants. But a few colleges are trying to do it differently. The California Institute of Technology is world famous for producing distinguished scientists and engineers. But Richard Bischoff, the director of admissions, is in awe of the school system for selecting students. When I came to Caltech to interview for a job, you know, my eyes were kind of wide open, jaw on the floor when I heard how Caltech does admissions. That's because Caltech says it only considers academic merit when choosing the members of its new freshman class. There's no slotting would be part of the lingo that some institutions would use. We don't have a system where, you know, we're going to have seven swimmers and three basketball players and four baseball players in every entering class. But we probably have the highest percentage of participation in athletics and varsity athletics amongst math, science, and engineering students. Well, there's nobody to state this question except uh, directly, but true or untrue that you also have probably the worst run and loss record. This is true. Although our women's basketball team this year, who, who for the first time won a conference game last year, uh, they, this Wait a year... for the first time won a conference for, game For the first year. time, they've only been in existence for about 10 years. They are now in the midst of their longest conference win streak, and they've won two conference games in a row. Despite their less than stellar court performance, the academic talent of the average applicant at Caltech is almost unparalleled. 
the caliber of the students that apply to Caltech is astonishing. We, we could randomly select students from our applicant pool and have one of the strongest undergraduate student bodies in the country. Caltech prides itself on having a very fair admissions process, but that fairness is sometimes in the eye of the beholder. Caltech's graduating class this year enrolled just two African-American students as freshmen. There, there is no question there is pressure on the admissions office and on this community to increase representation. And this year, we have a record number of applications from African-American students. We've grown our number of Hispanic applicants since four years ago by 50 percent. The, the number of women who've applied to Caltech have grown by almost 50 percent in the past three years as well. Still, Caltech's merit-based admissions process does expose some of the inequities of secondary education. One obstacle to diversity for Caltech is its strict admissions requirements. For example, every applicant must have completed advanced calculus in high school. That means students who come from schools that don't offer that kind of high-level course are effectively shut out. If I'm a student, my teachers think I'm a good student, principal thinks I'm a good student, but I live in Harlem or Huff or East Los Angeles, live in the barrio, my parents have nothing. With the current system, is it realistic for that student to dream of going to even a top 15 school? In many of the places you've described, the educational opportunities, you know, at the elementary and secondary level are much less efficient than they should be. And that certainly affects, you know, what we can do as an institution when students are applying to college. You know, on the other hand, we have students at Caltech from many of those same experiences that you describe. And for a very small number of them every year, we're able to make a decision that really changes the trajectory uh, of a student's opportunities. We had a, a student apply early action this year. This was a young man who grew up on a farm. Now, I know that if you're growing up on a farm, the kinds of engineering challenges you face every day. You may not see them as engineering challenges. You know, the tractor's just broken. <laughs> uh, we have to be able to see that in that student and say, yeah, th this is a student who brings the kind of experience that is going to be valuable at Caltech. When we return... SAT scores predict very little. We need to somehow break the stranglehold that that number has on young people thinking, this number determines my life. Four college presidents tell us what's right and what's wrong about the admissions process. We've shown you how students and parents go through the process of applying to college. They have to deal with the cost of college, the competition to get in, and the college rankings and standardized tests that influence their choices. But what about the college presidents? What do they have to say about the process? Doug Bennett is president of Earlham College in Indiana. Georgia Nugent is president of Kenyon College in Ohio. Tony Marks is president of Amherst College in Massachusetts. And Nancy Cantor is chancellor of Syracuse University in New York. Is the college and university admission system now what you would design if you had your druthers? Absolutely not. We've made a mess of it and uh, we can do better. Uh, we make some people uh, really uh, very anxious about getting into college. Uh, very well prepared students uh, grow tremendously anxious. And we have a lot of other students and I worry more about these who aren't sure that college is right for them, aren't sure they can afford it, and they wind up not going at all. All across the American public, we believe we want college to be accessible and affordable. Under the current system, colleges are rewarded for the students that they turn away and the more money that they spend. So there's something I mean, they go up in the rankings, those. the more students they turn away Correct. and the more money they spend. There's a frenzy around name recognition or brand name recognition. That there are rankings that suggest there's a single ordering of educational value when, in fact, there are different matches that make sense between students and, and different colleges. At Amherst, are you still part of the rankings or have you pulled out of the rankings? Well, we have said, and uh, with a group of other colleges, that we will no longer provide uh, the information directly to the rankings, that we will make all information public. At the same time, we recognize that uh, there are students, for instance, who don't know much about places like Amherst uh, in the United States or abroad 
who do use the rankings, for better and for worse, as a shorthand to try to figure out a very complicated system. We need to find other ways to get that information to those students, and I think we're all working at using information technology to, the, to that end. It is important to recognize that you will not find a college or university president who will be interviewed on camera and say, I believe these rankings are a good measure of educational quality. And if you can't find that person and interview them on campus to stand behind that, you have got to draw the conclusion that they're junk and that our being tyrannized and steering our decisions by that is a deep mistake. To the degree that we can frame the rankings to give us incentives to be more diverse, including economically, to have students from the bottom end of the economy who are great students and from the middle class that's being squeezed by our financial model and, and the tuition costs these days. If we had an incentive in the rankings to do that, then competition will drive us to do socially and educationally responsible things. Who is benefiting and who is losing with the system as it is? On each side, benefits and losses. So on the student side, the losses in my perspective are in low-income students, largely and increasingly of racial minority students. I actually think universities and colleges are losing too. The educational quality, the intellectual vibrancy, is highly a function of the mix of students that you bring to campus. My favorite thing to do when I was a provost in Michigan was, and Parents were so upset that students of color would get in instead of their kid and what would happen to them. And I would say, you know, just hold it. You know, I applied as an undergraduate to Michigan and was rejected. I applied as a graduate student to Michigan and was rejected. <laughs> My first job interview was as an assistant professor at Michigan. I was hired at Princeton, but not at Michigan. <laughs> and here I am, the provost. And, you know, we all need to bear those stories, I think, much more fully because we have an unrealistic sense that is, I think, promoted partly by these rankings, but partly just by the economy and, and the really sense of insecurity about a seat at the table. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I would tell parents is what will really work for your student in a global economy is to be at a campus where there's a very diverse group of students, and I mean diverse in every way. And, and that's one of the messages that I think we're hoping we can get out much more broadly to students and families, that there are these 3,000 and more American colleges and universities, and they provide wonderful educations. We need every college to be a good college. We all need to be committed to seeing that so that there are as many good options as there can possibly be, and then we sort out in as educationally constructive a way as possible to get as many students to go to college. That's the agenda. Absolutely. I think we all have to agree on that and work together towards that end. All our institutions are trying to look like each other. We're not emphasizing the way in which we're different. We're emphasizing that we're the same, that we're as selective, that our SATs are as high, that our financial aid packages are as good, and that's you know, one we might be proud of, but it's still making us all compete in the same way. So what are our students told? They're told, beef up your resume. Yes, we want our kids to care about the world, but we don't want them to do work just to have a resume that they can apply to college. Take AP courses, do well, do their pre-SAT prep courses. Well, you know, when I look at the kids in the city of Syracuse, they can't do those things. Mm -hmm. But there's where talent lies, and it's the talent that's going to be the increasing demography of our country. We reward all the things that more privileged kids can have access to. We haven't traditionally, for instance, given credit to a kid having to work to help support his family right. um, and said, instead look for volunteer activities. I mean, those were, are examples that they were, I don't think they were designed to be discriminatory, right. but they became discriminatory. We have to rethink how we make those judgments. For the student who says, I'm in a frenzy, I hate it. I, I'm studying for the SATs. This is my second time through and I'm taking another prep course for the SATs. And I feel this tremendous pressure and I don't know what to do. What do you say to that student? Resist. The, um, the great colleges and universities in the land are looking for students who demonstrate the kind of integrity um, of this is who I am, this is what I believe in, we have many students at the top end of, of academic performance. And we say, that isn't going to 
do it by itself. One of the things we know as educators is SAT scores predict very little. Uh, if we could get every person who's been successful in any terms in America to reveal their SAT scores, we'd see that people <laughs> right. made wonderful lives with an extraordinarily, extraordinary variety of SAT scores. And we need to somehow break the stranglehold that that number has on young people thinking, this number determines my life. Dr. Nugent, let's pull back for what we call in television the wide shot. Are the colleges and universities and parents and students ready to make a change, but fearful if they make the change that the student is going to be hurt, that the college is going to lose its prestige? Let's use that instead of the word ranking. Is it a case of who's going to blink first? You're right that we can look at each other and say who's going to blink first in a game, you know, in a poker game. I think much better would be who's going to reach their hand across the table and work together to change the system. Those efforts are beginning. There are efforts by school counselors, by the colleges themselves in different kinds of groupings to try and change this system and make it more effective, more appropriate, both for students and, and as a number of us have emphasized for the country. You may remember the high school seniors we introduced you to earlier in this story. We first talked to the students from Great Neck, New York and Providence, Rhode Island, just after they had applied to college. At Great Neck South High School, unsurprisingly, all the students we spoke to are going to college. All but one of them were rejected by their top choice, but they all say they're happy about where they're going and that the stress over the applications wasn't worth it. At Central High School in Providence, Marlene Jacquet is going to the University of Rhode Island with a generous financial aid package. Yes, yeah, it's a big deal. I'm going to be like the first graduate, the high school graduate, and the first one to go to college in my family, so it's pretty much a big deal. Her classmate, Kayla Gonzalez, is also going to URI on a full ride. I know that it's a good school for me. I know the programs are going to be good, and I think that I'm proud of myself because I actually did it, and it's like all over now, and I, I just, I'm just excited to see what's going to happen now. She's one of those kids that you wouldn't notice in the building. I mean, she's not one of those that walks around saying, hey, I'm Kayla and I'm doing this and I'm doing that, but she's a, she's a good student. She, students look up to her. She's a, she's a great leader. She's gonna do well. She's gonna, she's gonna you know, we'll read about her, I, I believe. My whole family is like, they're so proud of me because I'm getting to do everything that they wanted to do. And it's like, I'm fulfilling my own dreams, but their dreams too. Like Kayla, I was also the first in my family to attend college. I did so in a time when our institutions of higher learning were only just beginning to assume their role as engines of social mobility, places that were not only for the privileged and professional classes, but also for those parents who wanted their children to have opportunities that they themselves never had. A college education has a unique place in the American dream and in the American reality. A diploma has become a practical necessity for many jobs. But in considering the college application process, we must confront two signal challenges. One is keeping the gates of higher education open, truly open to all, even as the costs of attending and getting into college soar. And the other more fundamental challenge is making sure that the purpose of higher education to expand the horizons of young minds is not lost. From the campus of Drew University in New Jersey, for HDNet, Dan Rather reporting. Good night. If you would like to add your name to an email list for information on upcoming programs, or if you would just like to send a question or comment, please email us at viewer at hd.net.